what information can legitimately be used later in such a subject. Uh, and of course, the basic principle is that what is said in the sanctity of the mediation uh, remains there and uh, cannot be used. But is that entirely true? Probably not now in view of Pratt's case. Um, you're to some extent at risk. Um, but uh, has this issue ever arisen with any of the experience of any of our panel members? Um, basically a situation where there's been an attempt to use something that has been put forward in the mediation in the subsequent uh, uh, trial of the same proceedings? I think one, one of the difficulties is just as a matter of human nature. You've heard something in the mediation and then you've got to divorce it from your, from your mind yes. entirely. Um, and it's how you, you deal with the information that can be sourced in an independent way, so that you can use it. Yes. And you've got to be very careful about it, but it is hard to um, separate your own mind as to what you were told in mediation, and then say, well, I, I'm aware of this, but I can't do anything about it, um, because it's been yes. obtained information in a, in a, in a confidential way. That's and it's right. also yeah. using it derivatively, too, so you've got to be careful about it. Yeah. Isn't there a fundamental defect? I don't do mediation. Um, Could you speak up a bit, even with, sorry, the mic might be... Sorry, good. isn't there a fundamental defect? I don't do mediation, I do corporate reconstruction and things like that, which can involve the need for mediation. But, not yet. <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> but the, the, the problem is you do become aware of things, I assume, and you get put on different lines of inquiry, which would never have occurred to you. So that the moment you start to give away factual matters in a mediation or detailed factual matters in a mediation, you can be crucifying your own case, even though, strictly speaking, the content and the information you give can't be necessarily used per se. That's a very, that's a very good question, and to a large extent it goes to the very heart of the whole issue about mediation and how to handle it and what to do with the mediation. I might just approach it in this slightly different way with our panel members. Is it desirable to have no holds barred in the mediation to reveal your whole case in the interests of putting everything on the table? Because after all, that's what we're continually being told mediation is about, to try to settle the dispute by means of an open exchange between the parties and their advisors on what happened uh, and what um, solution might be capable of uh, resolving this dispute. But should you hold things back or should you be putting it all on the table? There's this, how do we resolve this fundamental tension between our obligations by taking part in the mediation on the one hand and the obligation to the client on the other with one eye on the ultimate day of the trial if it proceeds to a trial? I suppose the, the, the question is if the information is fundamental to the progress of the case, either the, the defence or the, um, the, the plaintiff's case, and if it is such fundamental information, then it will have to be relied upon in another form later if the matter doesn't resolve. So it is that inherent tension that, that one has um, of how far you do go in a mediation as to, as to show you how. But, um, again, it's going back to what the, the whole thing started with, it's forces for forces. Sometimes I will say to, to my opponent, uh, when I'm acting for a party, you know, you just reinforce the fact that this is all confidential. Um, other times uh, I might choose not to reveal, for example, in my area, with um, the defendants, I might not actually reveal the, con quite the content of say that's in the surveillance, but you might indicate that the surveillance that would be detrimental. Oh, so, okay. it, it, it's again, it's you just got to balance it, and but you can't. If you're asked, if I'm asked for surveillance, and there is, of course, I will say there is, I will not lie about it. Um, I might not necessarily provide information about what it actually contains. So, but if it was devastating enough to knock the claim out or substantially reduce it, I would get instructions to use it and show it. It's definitely, I agree, a balancing act, and, and that is. In the majority of cases, you do want the communication to be open. Um, but sometimes you have to be wary and conscious of the other side uh, being on a fishing expedition and trying to find some facts. 
and that's something that you'll obviously no doubt come across. Um, but as far as some case law is concerned, I'll just touch on the fact that there, there are some conflicting views about um, uh, what can be made of the information obtained in the course of mediation. There was a case of AWA Limited and Daniels in the Court of Appeal of New South Wales, and a party may learn certain matters from information obtained in the course of mediation or have its own views confirmed. Um, however, a party would not be made legitimately. Yes. However, a party would not be permitted to adduce evidence of any communication, as what Neil said, oral or written. That is sacrosanct. You can't talk about any communication that was made. But here, in this case, uh, the defendant thought there was a document in existence. It was confirmed uh, in the mediation, and later on, uh, the Chief Justice ordered that. Uh, the the defendant who actually wanted this notice to produce, to produce this document, actually got that order made and the document was provided because it was in the realms of, uh, he, that was his view before the mediation and it was confirmed. It wasn't actually written or oral communication about the details of, of the um, settlement or proposed settlement, so that was allowed. So that's one of the things where um, I stress that uh, there are limits to confidentiality. Yes, and uh, in other words, I think it's common ground is that, that there's no rule uh, of law that says you must reveal everything at a mediation. You don't have to do that. You're there to try to resolve the dispute. Uh, you'll naturally want to highlight the strengths of your case to persuade the other side to the settlement. But there is no obligation on you to reveal um, all of the details of your case, particularly unfavorable details. Gentlemen, it's the microphone. In 25 years of practice, one thing I've learned with mediations is that, to a large extent, how much you reveal depends on the state of the negotiations. The closer you are to settling, the more open the other side is in terms of discussing their strengths and weaknesses more genuinely enough. I suppose if you have experienced counsel and experienced solicitors, they'll generally have a fairly good idea whether the other people are being open or not. Um, and the mediator, a good mediator, will certainly indicate that as well. The more likely you are to reveal a bit more in order to get a settlement over the line. But the less the other side is negotiating, the more you're going to hold things close to your chest because uh, uh, it's fairly clear at that stage that they're not either acting in good faith or not prepared to budge from a certain point, and there's no point in giving ground away on a fruitless exercise. Probably the, probably the closer you get to the date of the trial, if there is a date, there may be some corresponding loosening up, uh, right. because the issue of cost is ever present in everyone's mind. Uh, the inevitable day is approaching very rapidly when they're going to have to put more money up to get the case going. I think it, uh, you touched on it before while I've got the microphone. The yeah. terms of settlement or uh, the settlement document, assumes it's, uh, assuming it settles, um, the general rule I've had again in long years of practice is that you never walk out without one. And sometimes that's a very uncomfortable. I remember many years ago when I was in the practice in the country, we'd all all the parties were from the country, as were the practitioners. The only one from the city was, was one of the barristers, and one of the uh, the mediator was from the city. And we'd uh, we it was a four-hour trip, so most of the people had come overnight and a four-hour trip home. The mediation started at nine o'clock, so we met the clients at eight. Finally settled, and it was an intra-family dispute about the division of uh, uh, farming amongst the children. The, the parents were still alive, they wanted to retire for pension reasons and other reasons, and it was a division of the, the uh, farming between the, and an agreement that hadn't worked and so on. But uh, the me mediation finally reached settlement terms or agreement about 10 o'clock that night, so it had been going for about 13 hours plus. Mm -hmm. People had to drive home, some of them four hours, but we made sure that even though it took another hour and a half, nobody left without signing the terms of settlement. I'd like to emphasize that in my experience and I presume in yours, um, that's one thing that uh, as a mediator we try to do, don't let people go without having at least something signed up. It may not be the final 
terms of settlement, but the great danger is that they're going to slip off the hook later on. Better to get people signed up on the day if you can. Now, um, time is moving on, and I know you all have directions, hearings, and things to do, so I'm going to jump to the subject, which again is a, a really something very basic and essential to the issues about how the mediation is conducted and what can make it a good mediation or what can make it a bad mediation, and that's the general subject of the conduct of the uh, mediator. What sort of mediator do you want? Um, what do you want the mediator to do? To sit there and listen and smile um, like some statue of Buddha? Or to um, beat the parties senseless over the head with a chair? Or somewhere in between there, which I presume is what you would like the answer to be. Um, but do you like, uh, uh, this is a question I'm asking rhetorically at this stage, uh, do you like a, uh, an interventionist mediator? The theory of mediation, of course, is that the mediator does not make suggestions on settlement and certainly does not give legal advice. Uh, that's not the role of the mediator. But in recent years in particular, mediators have, I think by and large, changed their approach to trying to make helpful suggestions. Um, there is one extreme case which some people know about in Sydney where a former judge who has been transformed into a mediator and charges very high fees came into his first mediation and said, well, I presume you want to know who's going to win and who's going to lose. Well, you're going to win and you're going to lose. They just exchanged offers of millions of dollars, which of course were you know, sent them into hysterics after that uh, advice from a former judge. Um, but that is not helpful, it's not in the best traditions, but there is another school of thought just to put everything on the table, that that's what they wanted, that's why they were paying $10,000 for uh, and they certainly got it from him, or uh, it was the case, mate. Uh, I can't know who it was. <laughs> they certainly got it. And today, if this particular former judge was conducting mediation, it would be conducted in exactly the same way, the only difference being the fees are now higher. Um, uh, but what sort of, um, what's your view about this? Interventionist or passive? I or certainly appreciate a mediator. Halfway between. Sorry, I certainly yeah. appreciate a mediator who will give the client some sort of input or guidance on the difficulties they see. Um, party's case or the strengths, um, but I wouldn't necessarily appreciate a mediator who came out and said you're going to win or lose. Um, you don't like that? No. Why don't you like that? Just to be the devil's advocate, apart from the fact that it's not traditionally the way a mediator should be paid, yeah. what is the practical consequence what for you as a solicitor of that attitude? Well, it certainly places you in an uncomfortable position for the client in terms of having to work through the process that then run expensive litigation and they're on a loose case as per that mediator's opinion and it is that mediator's opinion without having that full gamut of the evidence and the like. Um, so I think it's premature for someone to categorically say you're going to win or lose on the basis of a half a day or two hours having exchanged some information. Um, so that's certainly not a good idea. Not a good idea, no. certainly. But, but I mean, helpful idea. comments about Especially weaknesses if you spend in five years case. telling them they're going to win, and then a former <laughs> judge comes in and says that would not be well received. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Uh, but in any not event, the, the real answer to it is that it's not conducive to a proper mediation or a proper settlement of the case where the parties feel that there has been a resolution. I think that's the real answer to it. But what do you, well, that, what do you it, do it also polarizes feel about them, that? Doesn't it? That, that approach polarizes the, the two parties or the yeah. many parties because suddenly they've gone from a view of maybe we're going to negotiate this claim because there's something of value for me to give up or something yes. that we need we need to compromise to being told somebody else is saying there is an absolute winner and there's an absolute loser. Um, if I was in that mediation, I would uh, acting for a party. I'd be saying, well, if I'm told I'm going to win, why would I be giving anything away? Or if I'm being told I'm going to lose, why am I here? You know, and it's, sort of, it, it, it's an interesting proposition because that would put people in a, an all-win or an all-lose situation. And that's not the basis of, of a proper negotiation.
association, in my view. Um, when I'm a mediator, um, I have sometimes been asked as to what I call a person's prospects of success were or a party's prospects of success were. And I find that I often decline to provide that advice. I'm not there to give them the advice. No. What I can do is if you are in the settlement negotiations and if the parties are getting close or if they're in a range of figures, particularly not the sort of area that I work in, I can, yeah, I can provide a, a view as to what I think the general range of figures might be for that type of injury, for that type of claim. Based on analogous cases, yeah. you can see. Yeah. Um, and if, if an offer's within that range, um, but I won't be the one that's saying to the other party, you know, you accept this offer or you don't accept this offer. No. So that's not the role of the mediator. And sometimes mediators do go and transgress that, and I think sometimes they do overstep the line. And if, if you find that they do, as a, as a, as a representative of a party, I would take a mediator to the side and say, please don't do that. Yeah, it's not in front of everyone else, but you'd ask for it and never. Please. Um, I think what a lot of solicitors firms are really after is a mediator who is very commercial and his or her outlook. Yeah. So the whole point of the mediation is that we get an agreement that all parties are happy with. There's no point in saying you're going to win and you're going to lose. Because somebody can be unhappy at the end of the day. It's got to be ultimately a win-win situation. So you're after somebody, I think, who's going to stress the commercial outcomes, even in a personal injury case. It's not really commercial in the strict terms, but an outcome that both sides are going to end up walking out the door yeah. and all right, it's all over, it's mm -hmm. gone away, and look look what I've got out of it for, or what I've got from it. And that's that's what you're after. So it's very important, I think, that a, that a mediator is yeah. black and white. Mm -hmm. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. I find the selection of the mediator is crucial to how the mediation is going yes. to go. And I find if I have a bad experience with the mediator, I just use my feet and walk, and I never use them again. Did um, you say never use him again? Him or her. Oh, right. Okay. How do you choose? How do you choose a mediator? How do you? In, well, in from practically, past, I from mean. past experience, yeah. obviously, okay. good experiences. Um, often in terms of the clients and the mix and the, the opposing party, um, even the opposing solicitor or account, you know, legal representatives, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to weigh up uh, the personality of the mediator, whether that be good with your own client, uh, and also what, what's their expertise? Is it in construction or this is a construction matter? Great, uh, we'll use, use that person. But just touching on uh, what I would do as a mediator, what I actually do uh, in mediation is, I don't pressure or coerce or push parties to uh, come to a settlement, but I do gently guide them towards that because at the end of the day, um, looking at the commercial sense, it's better for the parties concerned. They don't have to worry about cost uh, and the lengthy, forget about emotional you know, stress of going to the trial and all that sort of thing. But I do try to um, gently push them in that direction because in, in my belief, it is the best. It is in the best interest of the party. In a constructive way. In a constructive way, of course. Result. Without yeah. advising, yeah. without telling them they're yeah. right or wrong, and all those sorts of things. Yeah. But yeah. you need the parties to be acting reasonably. Of course. To be able to get to that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There are just, just, just to add to yes. that. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. There are two examples I've had over a number of years of very good mediators, and they're examples of both of those. One is where there was some the negotiations were getting to a. a fairly critical point, but there were some real sticking points, and the mediator actually took the lawyers aside and not giving advice, but saying, in their opinion, this was a very experienced mediator, um, going over what the mediator saw as the strengths and weaknesses of each case as far as he knew it. And then once concentrated the lawyers' minds and we went back to the clients and yes. it actually resolved. The other one was a, a very interventionist one and it, and that was the mediator, it, resol it didn't resolve on the day but the mediator then followed up with phone calls to the solicitors to see if there was a way of actually, because we were fairly close and actually did result in settlement as a result of the mediator's intervention. Um, but I think... Did you welcome that approach yes, from the mediator? Yes, because... The other solicitor and I were faced with clients who were both obstinate 
but, but the solicitor and I couldn't get through, and we both <coughs> wanted it to settle. Right, okay. Or thought it should settle. This was pre-litigation, so there was no, no litigation on foot. I, <coughs> so oh, you'd have the fallback position as being able to say to the client, the mediator wants to know. Oh, what's yes, and, and, mm -hmm. and the client eventually settled as a result yeah. of that. I've, um, sorry. So the one, one other thing yeah. in terms of choosing the mediator, yeah. I agree with Judy's comment, and again, it's from long years of experience. A, you get to know who the good ones are from your own experience and from talking with colleagues, but B, and you're always open to new ones as well, but B, it depends on the parties and the nature of the dispute. There are some ones where I'll, I'll want somebody who is very interventionist because uh, I know they need to, to bang the, the clients around so the head a little bit. sometimes you welcome an interventionist. And there are mediator. times where a more passive okay. uh, mediator That's a good point, yeah. is much well, more... Well, I can ask Luke, who's with uh, our list in the office, uh, one of the helpful team there. Luke, do we have people on the list with experience in most, if not all, fields um, of the law who can fill the needs of mediators when people, for example, in this room bring your office and... Uh, we do, Neil, and we also um, get a lot of requests, as Mark mentioned, um, heavy hitters or, or head kickers, as some people call them. More yeah. so, maybe not for the mediator role, but for counsel um, yes. when, when heading into mediation. But yeah, we do have uh, barristers across all areas who do mediate. Right. Okay. S Stephen, well, there's an open invitation to you to... They can contact Luke or one of your colleagues in the office. Just um, as we're talking about our own experiences, I've found it's worked out for me anyway since 1963, I suppose, doing mediations, to divide it roughly into two parts. The first part being, this is the role of the interventionist mediator, that during the presentation by each party of their opening statements and their outline of the case, that I tend to confine myself to asking questions uh, simply to bring out points of their case and you learn a lot about the strengths and weaknesses of their respective cases simply by that. Secondly, in the latter stages of the mediation I've found it always very helpful to contribute to the solution, uh, not along the lines of um, hectoring them or even advocating that they should settle at all or for a particular amount or subject to particular terms, but simply to, first of all, ask them, are you confident that you will be able to prove these essential elements of your case? If you are not confident uh, of that, then you might think very seriously about moving towards a settlement of this dispute today, because that may well turn out to be a problem down the track if you can't prove these um, uh, essential elements of your case. That seems to work very well for the simple reason that they've got a lot on in their mind during the mediation and the, the back chat that's going on, and if they can concentrate by that means on their own case, it does contribute to them taking a sensible view. The second thing that can be done in the latter stages of the negotiation, it usually comes after several hours, is to uh, suggest constructively, but nevertheless suggest that one possible way of resolving the dispute might be such and such. How would you feel about that? And would you be happy if I relayed that to the other side? That middle course seems to work reasonably well. Now, we have a question, not necessarily a problem, we have a question that it's now five to nine, um, uh, and um, we would normally think about wrapping up at this stage because we have, have other things to do. But speaking for myself, anyway, I don't know about the others, I can stay behind and will to have a chat with you about uh, these issues, if you like, a bit further. But we should move formally now, I think, to uh, uh, finish. At least they are my instructions, and I don't feel I have authority to go beyond uh, that limit. Um, which means we've left a lot uh, undecided, but can I just make a few very, very brief comments? Familiarise yourself with the statutes. It doesn't take long to do so. The Federal Act, I mentioned the Civil Dispute Resolution Act. Uh, the Victorian one, of course, is the Civil Procedure Act. Um, they all have sections on, um, uh, uh, on, on mediation. Uh, the 
uh, Federal Evidence Act certainly does, uh, and also the Federal Court Act. Um, you should familiarise yourself with the provisions of that insofar as they relate to mediation, because they all deal specifically with mediators. And you've got to have that up your sleeve. They also all deal specifically with the question of costs and any other sanction that might be imposed uh, on you if there's some shortcoming. Could I urge you to have a look at Pratt's case too, by the way, um, uh, which is um, uh, the proceeding, it's the, the ACCC in Pratt number three, which is in Federal uh, Court Reports in 2009. This is the question where the civil proceedings were underway against Mr. Pratt, and in the course of that, some documents were tabled, and there was an agreed statement of facts made, which were then used against him in subsequent <laughs> criminal proceedings, and there's a great kerfuffle about uh, how far that should or could be done, and there is um, a, a solution to at least alleviating the dangers of that in an article which you can find very easily on the internet by doing a Google search under Pratt uh, and the ACCC. Um, you'll find it's a very interesting note. And there is a way of uh, lessening your problems in that regard if you're involved in similar um, civil proceedings by means of using provision, which is what section 191 of the Commonwealth Evidence Act. Um, and uh, it will suggest to you a means of expressing in an agreement with the other side what you are tabling and the basis on which you are doing it, which might save the day later on if someone wants to use those documents or that evidence against you. Now, I think we might have to finish there, and I'll nominally, first of all, thank our three panellists. Um, uh, I'd certainly appoint you as uh, uh, solicitor, barristers, and mediators, respectively. Um, and you might give consideration to that yourself. Anya has just reminded me that the Law Council of Australia has published uh, in 2006 ethical guidelines for mediators. Uh, so those of you who might be doing some mediation would be well advised to have a look at that. And also those of you who are representing parties and might have an opinion on what mediators should and should not do, likewise, uh, might find that useful to have a look at up. And the, uh, there are also guidelines you've reminded me by the Law Council of Australia on uh, guidelines for the parties themselves um, uh, who are taking part in, in mediations. Thank you very much for that, Anya. Matthew? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the list, I'd like to thank Judy, Neil, Anya and Steve. Just a round of applause. Includes our series on uh, ADR. Uh, this is the third, and all three can be found on the website. And the future uh, breakfast briefings we have most Thursday mornings, you can see the upcoming calendar of those uh, on the website. So uh, thanks very much for coming, guys. And